Hey. Uh, Curtis, you're muted. God, did I do that like the whole semester with my audio off? I could explain a few things. Never mind. Hi, Curtis. Hi, Morris. Well, how are you? Ah, uh, you know, okay, all things considered. Remote semester's done, grades are in. Same here. Wait, aren't you vaccinated? Ah, uh, yeah, sure I am. I've been fully vaccinated for, like, months now. Aren't you? Yeah, so why are we wearing these masks? Good point. Just be sure your computer antivirus is up to date. Will do. So which vaccine did you get? Ah, Moderna, of course. I got Pfizer. You know, everyone knows that the Pfizer one's the better one. Oh, yeah, right. I hope they kept the minus 80 cold chain intact. Whoever thought that minus 80 freezers were going to rise up into the public consciousness? Yeah, they never heard of them before. Well, hey, speaking of vaccines, did you see this article? There's a group that sequenced the messenger RNAs in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. That's pretty interesting. So, uh, you know, what did they see? Well, obviously, it's the coding region for the S protein of SARS-CoV-2, but there was one interesting variant. Uh, what do you mean? Well, it seems some people got the control GFP mRNA. So does that, like, make them immune to Aquaria Victoria, the bioluminescent crystal jelly? Or does it just make them immune to Marty Chalfie? Oh, you know what? I've already forgotten. Uh, COVID brain, you know. What are we meeting for? The GSA asked us to do a worm show for the 2021 meeting. Completely virtual worm show? Yep, we agreed to do a completely virtual worm show. Yeah, you know, after all, I love being on Zoom so much. It occurred to me that unlike our usual in-person show when everyone's at UCLA and Royce Hall, people that watch the show live will be watching over lots of different time zones. You know, it's going to be early afternoon in Southern California. In Europe, it'll be in the evening. And if you're watching from Asia, it's like 15 hours ahead. So that's what, four in the morning tomorrow? There's no way that people are going to stay up until four in the morning. If people did, arigato gozaimasu. Sie sie ni gamsahadni da. You know, the other thing about a virtual show, there's no live audience. How do we feel the reaction of the crowd. It's like no feedback. So everybody out there, post a live comment that says where you're watching from. Yeah, we can ask them to do that. How do we know that people watching are actually officially registered for the meeting? Well, we can use one of those CAPTCHA systems, but specifically aimed at worm people. I don't know that's going to work over YouTube. Yeah, you're right. And we really do need as much of an audience as we can get. So everybody stay. All are welcome. Yeah, don't tell the GSA this, but we don't care if you've paid. For some people, this is going to be their first real worm meeting since the pandemic started. Well, a lot of meetings that were supposed to occur, you know, in person in 2020 were just canceled. There was one worm meeting that did happen exactly one year ago, and that was the evolution meeting. I give a lot of credit to the organizers, Taewen Lo, Patrick Phillips, Annalise Pabby, and Kristen Brendel for making it happen, because it was just as the pandemic broke and we were all feeling at our most isolated, and so it was really great to have it. Thinking about, again, virtual worm show, any idea how we should do this? Um, I mean, Usually, we arrive a few hours before the meeting starts and interview people in the plaza. And now, like we're still at home. So instead of applause, it's just dead silence. That was sometimes what we got with some of our jokes. Every now and then, there were these rare gags that like resonated with people. And then we would get an applause break. Do you think we can judge our own jokes and edit in an appropriate response? Wouldn't that be like judging the impact of our own papers before they're published? You know, many of the great television comedy shows had laugh tracks. Maybe we could try some audience responses out. Okay, so you know how we're always looking for new places to publish our papers? We could let people know about some new PLOS journals. 
Floss Chalfie. <laughs> Floss anagrams. <laughs> Floss. Okay, boomer. <laughs> Lost Zoom. There's already a paper that tells us that Zoom makes us dumber. <laughs> Plus nematodes. Isn't it about time? Plus pandemic. I think people would rather we just try to keep things positive rather than being reminded of the worst things that have been going on in the last 15 months. Well, we could do all sorts of things that would not really be possible with an in-person show. We could, for example, do some clever things with Zoom backgrounds. Well, if this were the last meeting, we'd be running through the Worm Show script in a dorm room at UCLA. Yeah, like we all need to be reminded of the accommodation. Hey, at least they've got air conditioning. Okay, how about someplace more exotic? Good idea. Ooh, nice. The International Space Station. I guess that's fitting for an international worm meeting. How about we check out the latest Mars rover? And then, you know, why don't we come back down to Earth? Ta-da! We're in Royce Hall. Whoa, this feels so familiar. Except, of course, now no one's here. Everyone's at home. Plus, isn't the next meeting supposed to be in Scotland? Or actually was supposed to be in Scotland. Okay, I found some video of an actual landing at the Glasgow airport. Now I'm starting to worry about whether my luggage made it or not. You know, so maybe that covers the usual cold open. It's time for the opening theme. Right now, everyone needs something familiar and comfortable. That means... You got it. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Worm Show. Brought to you by... The Vaccine. I'm not throwing away my shot. Wait a minute. Is that... Yes, it is. It's a Hamilton syringe. I think that we should show people our vision statement. Vision statement. By all means. Wanda, I don't think any of this is real. Uh... I don't get that at all. Trust me, some people will. It'll be a marvel if anyone does. How about at this point, we do a Worm Show classic top 10 list? It could be brought to you by the new Apple AirTag. Track your proteins in real time. Here are the top 10 things we did during the pandemic. Number 10, increased our body mass indices. Number nine, took a vaccination selfie. Number eight, figured out how to do worm research without being in a lab. Can anyone say bioinformatics? Number seven, taught a class on Zoom while wearing pajamas from the waist down. Refreshed 538 election projections several times a week. Several times a week. I was refreshing it several times an hour. Yeah, I think I was doing that sometimes too. Now, just think how many people all over the world actually learned what the Electoral College is. Number five, refreshed a COVID tracker several times a day. Yeah, hoping for trends that things were getting better. Only to see things go up and down several times. Number four, we put like a thousand kilometers on our cars for the whole year. 
with the accompanying measly auto insurance discount checks. Number three, had our hands dry up from all the hand sanitizer. Number two, wore out a chair, mouse, keyboard, etc. in our home office. And the number one thing we did during the pandemic, binge watched Tiger King. And a half a dozen other shows. I imagine that we'll be talking a lot about Zoom and other internet connection related things that allowed us to do a lot of what we normally do even during quarantine. Well, maybe abnormally, that is. Which brings to mind a new Latin maxim. Covido ergo Zoom. But while Zoom is great, it still has some issues. Yeah. How about when someone is the source of an echo? Echo. 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 Or unintended sound effects in the background. How about when you're at a boring meeting and the video you're watching comes up and your, your mic is on, you haven't muted? My version of Zoom lets me put video filters on other people. So it makes for some really funny meetings because they don't realize it's happening. Oh, come on. That's not real, is it? No, you're right. It's not possible. How about when someone's not really paying attention uh, because they're looking at their email? Hello? Oh, Hello, Curtis. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you were saying? Oh, okay, how about when your connection's unstable and your voice ends up sounding like a robot? Sentence I'm saying now. How about when the opposite happened and Zoom has to play your video fast to catch you up? I know exactly what you're talking about. How about when someone else joins unexpectedly on a meeting in progress? Hey guys, how's, how's it going? What are you guys doing here? Hey, what's up? Uh, oh, this is awkward. Uh, yeah. We're meeting right now to talk about the Worm Show. Yes, what? I'm not sure what you guys are doing here, but you should both leave. Yeah, you don't belong here. That was weird. So Curtis, I thought maybe one thing we could do is ask some of our colleagues what their favorite memories of Zoom are. I think the better question is what haven't I done on my computer during a Zoom meeting? <laughs> right, an NIH grant. The beehive puzzle from the New York Times, absolutely. I've written recommendations. I've written, I, I've submitted grants. I answer emails. I answer my personal emails. It's like everything's going at once. Sorry, what did you say? I try not to. <laughs> I take a lot of notes. And so typically I was trying to refine the Zoom window. Well, I have to admit, I'm always tempted to check my email, and I do it sometimes, but I try to resist. <laughs> Mostly going on web base and uh, looking for articles. Uh, during Zoom meetings, I often read and answer to emails. I think texting is the first one, you know? <laughs> Isn't it terrible? I'm not texting right now, but... We went on a 20-mile bike ride, and then I also went on some long walks. Grady essays. <laughs> Student uh, homework grocery shop online. <laughs> Graded homework during Zoom faculty meetings. I'm not going to tell anybody how much time I spent on new PI Slack during Zoom conferences, but I can say that it was a lot. Um, that community has been really great for helping me get through this. I was taking a class in American Sign Language, so I have my Zoom window open. There's no audio in the class. She will only sign to us my niece FaceTimed me at the same time. I take a look away, I'm talking to my niece for a second, I look back at the other screen, everybody is just waiting for me to say something. And so I was so mortified that at the end of the class, I went online and I dropped it right away. Students who would log on to Zoom and then clearly just walk away from their computers, um, and then class would end. And so I would often leave the Zoom meeting open just to see if they ever came back. Howard Lipschitz used the pig filter on a SE meeting briefly. I thought that was funny. 
I have a Tuesday class and then a lab on a Thursday. And I have two separate links for this. There were three times in the semester where you click the link, the class is about, you know, it's maybe five minutes to start and the kids don't show up. Like, where, where are the kids? I realize this, that I'm on the Tuesday link and not the Thursday link. So I go back and I pop in and I, the kids just die right? because I feel like such a complete moron when this happens. A couple times I taught, uh, I did a sort of live lectures um, with, that included some hands-on demonstrations, and I did them from my shed, from inside my shed. And I, I thought they went really well, and then I saw the videos and talked to the students and realized I looked like a crazy person. <laughs> the funniest thing that happened on Zoom was uh, talking to my son, 4,000 miles away, and he fell asleep during the conversation. So, <laughs> so at first, it looked like he was being very thoughtful and quiet, and then his head started sinking down. <laughs> Until it was below the camera, it was hilarious. One time I was trying to put my daughter to sleep for a nap while I was in a faculty meeting and she just kicked me right in the face. So this was literally herding cats. Everybody got their cat and tried to gather them together for the lab picture and this is the result and a lot of us have black and white cats. I was on this committee, Enterprise Resiliency Committee, right? And I was on this, and you can imagine, like, you put, put, put a bunch of basic scientists on, on a committee like this. We're going to sit there and text each other with all making funny jokes about some of the things that was going on. And one of them, I burst out laughing, and the guy who's running the meeting is the vice president of research. And so it was, it was very embarrassing. When I was teaching my classes, uh, many of the lighthearted moments, jokes, just landed flat all the time. I was giving an online seminar and I was in the after seminar Q&A with students and postdocs and the babysitter that I hired to take care of my four-year-old got locked in the bathroom and she started desperately texting me. This was all happening in the same house during the pandemic. So I had to quickly run upstairs and try to unleash her from the bathroom door, which was barricaded and locked. I definitely accidentally unmuted myself during a prominent speaker's thing and made a very audible hmm when they uh, had something to say that I thought was especially interesting. Hey, Curtis, you ever use DocuSign for official business? Right, that thing uh, where it's PDF file and you add your signature. Right. But it's so much work to adopt your real signature that you just end up using the font-based one. So that means... Ta-da! I have all the DocuSign signatures of all the worm Nobel laureates. Nice! So Curtis, I had this idea of taking one of the videos from the 2019 show and reusing it in some clever way. Sounds like a good idea. So this bit could be funded by... You have Dogecoin and Bitcoin, and now the latest in cleptocurrency, Wormcoin, now accepted by the CGC. Does that have something to do with non-fungible tokens? Or maybe non-fungal tokens? Or could be sponsored by the new Aquaria Victoria fluorescent protein lamps. These are real. Oh, I see. They come in multiple flavors, including classic green fluorescent protein, blue fluorescent protein, and of course, magenta fluorescent protein. Wait a minute. We talked about this last worm show. There is no magenta fluorescent protein. But it's right there in front of you, so you can't argue with that. Hello, Talking Shark here. We all know that the pandemic has caused a disruption in the fabric of society. I hypothesized that things could have been better if scientists were warned in advance. I recently obtained a time machine that will let me make a one-time trip of one hour into the past. I decided to target the most intelligent group of individuals I can think of. But those people were not available. So I'm targeting the C. elegance community at the conference of June 2019, where the greatest worm minds were gathered in one place. Here we go! Ah! 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 
That wasn't the time travel, by the way. That was something I had for lunch earlier. Okay, let's find some worm people and warn them about 2020. So, what's it like to work at Worm Base? It's pretty, it's pretty great. Paul's a great guy. <laughs> it's really challenging. Uh, I just hope people can answer our emails. I was wondering, how much better do you think Worm Base would work if you were all socially distanced? <laughs> a lot better, really, I think, actually. <laughs> Extracellular vesicles are released via a lipid asymmetry model and ciliated sensory neurons. You should tell that to Anthony Fauci. Hello. So you work for Nema Metrics? Yes, I do. I work for Nema Metrics. I think Metrics. you're going to want to change that name. You can spin sure, the wheel for not? some prizes. A notebook. Oh, can okay. I use that for contact tracing? <laughs> some people are going to say that it might have escaped from a virology lab. But it's probably bats. So Mark, you've been doing genomics a long time. How many years? Oh, it's, it's a guy long time, an awfully, awfully long time. It's a, it's a very grisly field, aye, aye. What do you think about the evolution of coronaviruses? I ate it for dinner, but I wasn't a vegetarian then. Not sure what that means. Next year, they're going to have to stockpile something important. Toilet paper! <laughs> So where is your email? I have to send you something important. Oh, you have to look it up on the QR link. Well, maybe this is something that can't go in an email anyways. In a couple years, have fun storming the Capitol. This is a very nice image, but what you really need to do is transmission EM on the spike protein. The spike protein! So Ken, I hear that you like to get regular seasonal vaccinations. Yes, I did. Let me tell you, you're going to want to get the mRNA vaccine made by Pfizer. Yeah, yes. It's very nice work, Barth. So tell me, how productive do you think you can be from home? People have to wear masks everywhere, and it becomes political. <laughs> I'm almost out of time. It seems that worm scientists already have herd immunity. As a group, they are completely immune to the doomsday predictions of a talking shark. Who knew? Maybe that was the time travel. I wish your species the best. Talking shark out. So Curtis, I thought at this point would be a good place for us to do our usual simple interviews with worm folks, like asking them about their favorite strains, and this time asking them what TV shows they might have binged during the pandemic. Yeah. The triply mutant mapping strain from the Horvitz lab, like MT465, they, they're super useful for old school mapping. I would have to say Dumpy Five, because I just think they're super cute and adorable. Fog Two. I love her. I really like rollers. Knob One. No back end, hands down. And Two. I did my whole PhD on it. <laughs> Dumpy One, E1, because this was the first mutant and Sidney Brenner must have been sitting there looking down in the scope, saw this round, dumpy worm, and that was the beginning. We use JM149 a lot, LTGFP, and um, I just love the rollers. Unk22, also known as the Twitcher, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's dancing around like crazy. I think if you haven't seen it, you need to get that strain and take a look at it. Train JU258. Uh, it's the first C. elegans I found uh, out of the lab. Uh, my favorite mutant strain is a dumpy. I love the LED60 uh, game of function, all those cute little L sites. My god, totally my favorite. <laughs> love one. Obi-Wan. 
because it can feel the force. Roll six, they chase their tails. <laughs> CCPP1, OCA1821 deletion allele. Oh, I'm gonna to have to go with Dumpy. I definitely love a thick wormy. I love my O2 GFP. Turn down the transmitted and you just see these little floating pharynxes, pharynges all over the plate. I love it. My O3. I think of them as little disco worms. The 41 GFP is my favorite fluorescent strain. This is a Loma site reporter, no question. Any Anything that glows in the cell that can get me transgenic, I'll take it. It becomes my favorite thing. <laughs> Uh, probably myosin my marker NMY2 GFP because um, it, it showed us that we could track intracellular dynamics uh, as cells change shape much better than we expected and better than in most other systems where people are trying to do it. My favorite reporter strain is where we took a transcription factor called FA4 hooked up to GFP and a target uh, promoter and FA4 will bind that promoter. And so that's amazing, right? Because you're looking in a living animal, watching a transcription factor bind to its target. So that would be my favorite. DLG1 GFP is really beautiful. And I also really like GLH1 GFP. The Neuropal strain from Ed Fumini and Oliver Hobart, which labels all the different neurons in a rainbow of different colors. It's super pretty and incredibly useful. Right now, it's a strain that was sent to me by the lab of um, Zhongying uh, Zhao, which is a Fuchi cell cycle reporter. It's absolutely great. You get the cell green when they are in the cell cycle and red when they stop. My favorite fluorescent reporter is Neuropal. Sad one GFP. I use it for recruiting, actually, because there's nothing like showing live worm to students where you can see the corpses and they're all like, oh, <laughs> you know, our all sides. I'm pretty single-minded here. Love one. This year, it's the Pristiancus Codon Optimized RFP. You can inject anything, it'll glow in Pristiancus. Body wall. PTL1 M Neon Green, which is a CRISPR knock-in. My favorite fluorescent reporter is L2 because I'm a sucker for polka dots. The, the favorite one that I can tell you about is going to be the Queen's Gambit. And then I might have also really enjoyed the Tiger King. Bones. Um, the Handmaid's Tale. I watch Bloodline again. I really like Bloodline. Uh, Underground Railroad. It's it's part real, part fictionalized, uh, based on a book. I have to confess, it would be K-dramas while eating ramen noodles. I watched The Witcher early in the pandemic and more recently, Philly DA. My wife and I just finished watching a show called Counterpart. The closest that goes to this is that the French National Theatre, the actors have been actually every week reading plays on a half stage. So I've been watching this a lot. Last year, I watched Star Wars The Mandalorian. And uh, after that, Yilian Chu, um, she made me this uh, awesome little Grogu. Uh, he's now my mascot, so thank you very much, Yilian. I definitely binge watched many, but my favorite one was Merlin. Magic. <laughs> there weren't too many of them. Uh, Killing Eve is the best one. Westworld, because sometimes I feel like people are robots around me. The Great British Baking Show, and then it makes me hungry, and then I want to eat something. <laughs> Game of Thrones. Yep, I got sucked in eventually. Does rewatching all of the wire count? You know, I love some feel-good television. So Curtis, do you realize Wormbase is like 20 years old now? Wow, that's college age. You remember what it looked like originally? Well, here's what I could find on the internet Wayback Machine. <laughs> wow, love the default Times font, the original Pharynx Laxy reporter image. For extra authenticity, I simulated its appearance in Netscape. Netscape, okay. Well, 
if any of you out there remembers that this is how the World Wide Web of Worms looked, it's official. You've been in the field for quite a while now. That does remind me of this thing from a few years ago. You know how we can go back to frozen worm stocks that are like 40 years old? Well, how about a few more orders of magnitude than that? These scientists in Russia working with scientists in Princeton thawed worms that were around 40,000 years old. Well, I guess there's some hope for us old phobies yet, huh? Immortality through cryopreservation. Yeah. Our next segment is brought to you by... The scariest jack-o'-lantern ever. Reviewer number two. So Curtis, we're both educators, like many in the C. elegans community. We can all relate to the problems associated with having to suddenly move our classes online. Yeah, like teaching to a sea of turned off cameras, just a bunch of names, some of which are aliases, and, and then there's Zoom bombing. And the cheating. I wonder how many instructors out there have noticed this. Like streaming with PowerPoint has suddenly become a more effective teaching tool. And before remote teaching, hardly any professors had ever heard of Chegg.com. And now most of us know this website that makes it nearly impossible for our exams to measure what students actually know. Just in case someone doesn't know, Chegg is one of those websites that allows students to post questions and answers can be posted sometimes, you know, within minutes. So what's in it for the people that post the answers? Well, apparently this is real. They actually can get gift cards. So the idea is that these sites help students do homework, but the main use has been for them to upload exam questions during exams. And so we're forced to either make super hard tests or give only a few minutes for students to answer each question. Which they don't exactly appreciate. Did you see this? You know worms have made it when a question gets posted to Chegg. Maybe that's a Cheggel phenotype. Someone out there watching just realized that their test has been compromised. Well, how do you know that a student posted it? Maybe someone working in a worm lab had a question. Yeah, don't you think they would post something to Wormbase Forum and Hillel Schwartz would answer? Well, I've got an idea for something that just might solve the academic integrity problem. Okay, let's take a look. Are you an instructor in higher education whose assessments have been forced online? Are you frustrated by students who look up homework and test questions on the internet? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a safe and convenient way to punish those who take the easy way out? Now there is. Introducing CBOT, an integrated software solution that uses artificial intelligence to emulate the knowledge base of a C student. CBOT takes your exam questions and posts them on homework websites with the wrong answers. Students search for your questions and find those wrong answers, which gets them the grade they deserve, automatically. Let's put CBOT to the test to demonstrate its uncanny ability to answer biology questions with seemingly correct but wrong answers. What are the four gamete types of a big A, little a, big B, little b individual? Big A, little a, big B, and little b. Which is the leading strand at a replication fork? The one with the Akamak fragments. What organisms have cellular respiration? Animals, not plants. What is insulin? An enzyme that digests glucose. How did Seabot do? What do professors have to say about Seabot? It's a time saver, back to normal distribution centered around a mean of 65%, just where it should be. Saves me having to search the internet for my own questions. Now I know they're out there, but they've all got the wrong answers. What do students have to say about Seabot? Thanks to Seabot, the internet now has false information on it. How am I supposed to get into medical school now? So much for getting straight A's this term. F*** you, Seabot. Seabot is platform independent, running on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and requiring only a core i5 processor or equivalent and 8 gigabytes of RAM. Seabot, it's time to level the playing field.
And of course, we promise not to sell your exam answers. Nice, nice. I could really use that. Well, you know, it's one thing to teach a lecture style class. How about teaching labs? Last spring, my techniques in molecular biology class went virtual about halfway through the semester, right in the middle of a four-week cloning project. I ended up finishing off the project myself, shooting video and editing it. It can be really hard to listen to yourself in the video doing lab demonstration. So I'd listen to myself and I'd say, oh man, you are so full of shit. I started adding a running text commentary on my lab demo as I was giving it, making snarky comments, uh, just to sort of lighten things up. So this is how I shot it. It took a little work to like figure out getting the right angle on this and so on. So I shot all this stuff so I could have two hands, you know. Oh man, that was so much work. So <laughs> after that, rest of the semester, bioinformatics. So Curtis, I thought this point might be a good time for us to ask our colleagues in the worm community how they dealt with the pandemic for the last year. Like many couples, you found out you could live with your spouse 24 seven without going crazy. Well, the election, the bad man went away for now. My daughter graduated high school. Oh, and because she had to come home from the Appalachian Trail, she painted the whole house. Yeah, I didn't have to drive to work in the snow. <laughs> More time with my family in the lab. There is some fantastic, really constructive team thinking about how to work safely and what we could get done, that kind of thing. Bonding with my cat, sleeping in my electric bicycle. I loved having lunch with my kids during the day. We got a kitten that was born right at the beginning of the pandemic, and we got to see it grow up from a kitten to an adult. It's been fantastic. One thing that's great in Paris is that uh, they extended the cafe and restaurant terraces. You see an ocean of cafe and terraces at the moment. Our lab got an ERC grant, so we're excited to start some fun science. My student graduated with a PhD. A couple of my lab you know, students got fellowships. I think there's lots of good things that happen. Tony Fauci. I love him. I think the no traffic and less commute. I come home energized. Science. We got a vaccine. How amazing is that? The lab did gain its first two graduate students, which was pretty great. It was really exciting to see the team start to grow. I miss the students interacting with each other in that bustle. I miss the, the being in the lab with the, with the students. Oh, my worm friends at worm meeting and hugging them. Oh, I miss the meetings, of course, and socializing with my colleagues and going out late and drinking with them and pretending like I didn't actually have a family at home. The travel and seeing people. Uh, seeing people in real life, you know, the actual human connections that really breathe life into the science. Hallway conversations, you know, bumping into my lab and just having the informal conversations that you have when you just see each other. I miss that a lot. Conferences. I miss just walking to get coffee in the middle of the day. Well, I miss going into the lab and doing experiments with my own hands. This is my sabbatical year when I have a chance uh, to do that. And at the beginning of the sabbatical, I, I couldn't. Well, of course, meetings, conferences, especially the one meeting in life. It's definitely going to conferences interactions. Right? I really miss it. I miss not being able to see my scientific friends, give them a hug, do this in person. I really miss seeing people. I am really miss running into people at the board meeting. I miss training the students. I haven't had new students for a year and a half. In-person meetings and informal interactions and scientific conversations. The in-person berating of undergrads I miss the most. Random interactions that I'd get to have with friends and colleagues. I didn't realize that that was really the fuel that keeps me going. 
parties with friends, working out in a gym, and visiting family. I look forward to having more impromptu conversations. International Worm Meeting, I think it's 24th in 2023 in Glasgow. Be there. Dinner parties, in-person lab meetings without masks. I'm most looking forward to travel. As much as I hate it, sometimes I, I do love it. Because I do so much outreach, I really do miss talking with the young kids. Hugging. <laughs> I miss hugging close friends, uh, close, close relatives outside of our own house. Informal conversations in the hallway and lab, seeing my lab folks more frequently, um, and exploring Europe. I really am looking forward to having more people in the lab and going back into the lab and shopping and seeing music and visiting with friends outside. Going into the lab and doing experiments. I'm going in tomorrow and we're going to inject neuropeptides into different parts of worms and see what happens. Get rid of these masks. I very much look forward to traveling again. Hang in there and I hope to see you all at the next International World Meeting in Glasgow in 2023. I can't wait to do things in person again. Traveling and getting out of New Jersey. I would like to travel again and I would enjoy not heckling my kids about masking and washing their hands. In-person meetings. Maybe even the 2023 worm meeting and a worm dance party. See you all in 2023 for the worm meeting. I'm looking forward to socially distancing because I'm socially awkward rather than this whole pandemic socially distancing. Worm people are the best people. It's just being able to order a mixed drink on an airplane on my way to some sort of meeting or conference. I love the worm community and I can't wait to see you all in person hopefully soon at another meeting. Bye. You know, Curtis, every time we've done a worm show to date at an international meeting, the art show results always took place right beforehand. This year in the virtual meeting, they're actually going to be on separate days. I always thought it might be a nice idea to take one of our worm show bits and do it as a collaboration with Honest Scope, who runs the art show. Yeah, after all, sometimes it actually seemed like the art show and the worm show were sort of competing for laughs. Then what could be a better reason to collaborate? Hello, and welcome to another edition of Between Two Worms. I'm Mac Galifianakis, and my guest today is On A Scope. Anna. Anna, tell me about your last name. How'd you get it? So Scope is a Ukrainian name. Actually, there's a fun fact is that my dad's name is Microscope. My father was not given a middle name from his immigrant parents, but his high school biology teacher thought he had such an awesome name. His middle name should be Ro. And so my dad legally changed it. Given an artist, he used to draw this little microscope at the bottom of my on of his drawings. My father wanted all of us to have names like stethoscope, gyroscope, telescope, but my mother said, absolutely not. So I had to go to settle for on a scope, which is why I became a C. elegans biologist. I think if you were to be a Marvel movie character, you could be atomic force micro. Actually, I think I would prefer to be kaleidoscope, given my colorful personality. You'd be like the ultimate fluorescent protein. I think your movie character could be Captain Unfunny. So tell me about this worm art show. The worm art show started about 1997 when I was a graduate student, about 24 years ago. And so I thought, let's set this up. And I, it was a way to share all the beautiful things I was seeing under the microscope. And I actually wanted to see what other people were looking at, too. And over the years, we've had worm costumes, microscopes out of cookies, lamps made of discarded bombardment discs, to knitted worms. I hadn't realized how creative my colleagues were, more importantly, that they had similar hobbies as I did in the arts. So it's one of the main reasons why I stayed in science and one of the reasons why I really love the C. elegans community. There's a funny story I have to share with all of you. When John White told me that I could organize the art show, but not to include him, he ended up uh, submitting his vulva. So John White has a vulva. Well, John had reconstructed the vulva cell lineages with Benjamin Pavilovitz. He thought his wooden vulva shouldn't sit in his closet any longer, but everyone was surprised that he entered his vulva in the show. 
Tell me about your role in this If Then program. <laughs> it's actually a lifestyle statue. I got 3D printed of myself. It's sponsored by the AAAS. And it is myself and 125 other women scientists were selected to be ambassadors for women. There's actually two worm scientists in this exhibit, you and Beata Mirzwa. Do you suppose they're planning to make a giant foosball table out of it? <laughs> so you're at, where are you here? University of Wisconsin-Madison. The worm meetings used to be there in the 80s and 90s. So do you think they moved away from there to get away from you? That was exactly the reason. But the, I'll tell you the real reason was actually due to cream pie damage to the curtains in the main hall during the food fight, which was started by Bruce Bowerman and Eric Jorgensen. Not that any other model organisms group had been so damaging to the curtains in UW-Madison history. So we had to move away to UCLA. So do you feel that the worm meetings then have opened doors for both artists and people who like to play with their food? Yes, I think 100% more so than the food. <laughs> so well, what do you work on? Your research, what do you work on? What do I work on? I work on this amazing thing called the midbody. But for the past four years, I haven't worked on worms, so I'm working on HeLa and Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. For the past four years, you haven't worked on worms. This is a little bit scandalous. My postdoc actually was in tissue culture. So we're isolating midbodies from different cell types, and these are much easier to do in tissue culture cells. So how do you think the worm meetings could get more creative? I guess to me, I, what I would add to the meeting would be a uh, talent show. Well, I've seen a lot of people you know, at the meetings, at the dance, particularly with lots of talents. I, you know, I, not that I would say anything there, but I've seen quite a bit of talents. What do you think about having a future worm meeting, like on a cruise ship? Kevin O'Connell and I had thought of this years ago, that wouldn't it be great to be trapped on a boat with all these other worm scientists? <laughs> the worm boat, exciting and new. Come aboard, your OP50 is waiting for you. This interview was supposed to be full of like, Lots of insults and awkward moments. There, there were enough. You get enough awkward pauses in the real <laughs> worm show, so. Well, this has been another episode of Between Two Worms. My guest has been the inimitable Professor Ophthalmoscope from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you. Anna. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Curtis, before I forget, I have a great idea for a short musical parody. Well, the virus is a coronavirus, namely a virus that we have a lot of experience with, but it's a brand new virus.
So Curtis, I've noticed a trend in journals recently. You know how you have big journals like Cell or Nature? So what have you noticed? Well, it seems that there are some unscrupulous folks out there capitalizing on the names of these famous journals by having similar sounding titles. So we have Cell, and then there's also the journal Cells. Really? Do you have another example? Yeah, here's one that's just running away. You know, you have Gene, and there's also Genes, but then it got pluralized again. Check this out. Jeanses. Mmm, very Golemesque. Like hobbitses. So are we warning folks in the community to keep a lookout for this disturbing publishing trend? Yes, people need to be aware. For example, be on the lookout for science, sciences, and sciences. -es. And don't forget about journals with numbers in them. You can just keep increasing it. Right. You already know about G3, but just keep increasing the number and you have G4 and G5. Obviously, the implication is that journals with more S's and bigger numbers are somehow better? Absolutely. So G4, that's like one better than G3, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. So Curtis, do you remember that a few years ago, Dave Reiner had this great suggestion to make a virtual game show like Jeopardy? Sounds like a lot of work. Well, maybe we could do something like that, but a little simpler. Save the Jeopardy idea for some time in the future. Are you saying we're going to do another worm show at some point? Well, it does seem like we retired and then came back anyways. Don't remind me. It's time to play the Sea Elegance community's favorite two-minute game, Airport or Neuron. Welcome to our contestants. The rules are simple. Be the first to ring in with the correct answer. Is it a major airport or is it a worm neuron? Let's play. C, D, G. Marianne. Airport. Bien sûr. Génial. Here's the next clue. P H A. Susan. Worm gene. No, I'm sorry. That's not one of the choices. Oh, shoot. Anyone else? Bob. Airport. So close, but not quite. Crap. Maureen. Neuron. Correct. Yes. Next clue. D V B. Tay Wen. Neuron. Correct. Yay. <laughs> Yes, Ray. You are. Sorry, Taywen beat you to it. Oh. Next clue. L A X. Swati. Airport. Correct. Yes. Next clue. A L M. David. Airport. Sorry, no. Shoot. Anyone else? Judith. Neuron. Yes, it is. Woo! Next clue. B A G. Michael. Airport. No. Neuron. Well, that's correct, but you already said airport, so we can't give you the point. Darn. Anyone else? Cheryl. Neuron. Absolutely. <laughs> Next clue. L-H-R. Anna. Airport. Correct. Yes. Next clue. D-F-W. Susan. Um, airport. Correct. Yes. Next clue. A-W-C. Judith. Airport. No, I'm sorry. Puffer pooper dumper. Michael. Neuron. You got it. Yes. Next. N R T. Tay Wen. Neuron. Oh, sorry. Darn it. <laughs> Anyone else? Bob. Airport. Yes, it's an airport. Yes. A S E. Maureen. Airport. No. Darn it. Anyone else? David. Neuron. Yes, indeed. Yes. And our last clue. P V C. Ray. You are correct. Yes. And our time is up. Talking Shark, what's the score? Every person has one point. Each contestant will take home a brand new dichroic beam splitter. Zit. Darn it. Darn it. Crap. Yay. <laughs> My thanks to our contestants. See you next time on Airport or Neuron. So Curtis, You've heard of Publons, which is a way of quantifying and getting credit for the paper reviews that we do? Sort of like codons that Sidney Brenner supposedly was the one who coined that in the 1960s when they were working on the genetic code. Why only count Publons? There got to be lots of different ons that we could be collecting on our CVs to get credit for every single thing that we do. 
So here are some suggested particles associated with other types of energy we expend. So we can formalize our bean counting for administrators. Recommendons. How many letters of recommendation for students you've written? Classons. How many online classes you've given? Transposons. How many mobile genetic elements you've discovered? Zoom meeting ons. Every virtual faculty or committee meeting that you've attended and stayed awake with your video on. Scriptons. Every time you've written a script to do some data science. I thought that was a Python. Gonadons. How many times you've had to inject something because no one in your lab can do them anymore? Freeze-ons. How many strains you've managed to freeze down? Scopons. Every time you're the one to clean the microscope. Sudokons. How many number grid puzzles you've solved? Anatons. For every annotation you've provided for Wormbase. And finally, mentorons. Every time you give useful advice to a graduate student or postdoc. One thing we should do is include any submissions that people make of interesting things from their own labs or any fun facts. I heard that Emily Tremel, UC San Diego, practically swam the English Channel. That's a long way from San Diego. Well, she did a 45-minute ocean swim while wearing a GPS tracker. So that path she swam looks kind of familiar. Yeah, that shape really rings a bell. Plus, this one from Oded Rahavi, the only worm researcher in a neuroscience department. She also sent us this one, a worm newbie trying to get their pick onto a worm. Plus, this note added in proof, Worm Costume by Antonina Andreva and Laura Grundy. And in the same category, pre-pandemic Halloween costume from the Feldman Lab. And finally, this video submission from Cheryl Van Busker, Cal State Northridge. First question. Yeah. How would you pronounce this word? Hi, nor habit. It's and you say. Oh, okay, no habitus. Uh, see, see, nor. Have have a do that. K norm. Wait, wait, wait. K nor rab body this. Okay. C nor habitus. Maybe. So it's C nor habditus. Oh my goodness. C nor habditus. Very close. <laughs> so it's C nor habditus. Yeah. Super close. It's the A after the C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What type of organism do you think it is? I have no idea. What kind of organism, huh? That's a good question. Yeah, um, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> a plant? Mmm, a bug. Is it like a bacteria, maybe? A C. elegans is usually studied for longevity studies, but it's like a small microscopic organism. It looks a lot like a worm, looks clear under a microscope. It's, it's a worm. It's a worm! Yep. It's oh a worm. my god! It's a worm. How big do you think C. elegans can get? Maybe, maybe like a few centimeters? How big? Um, maybe 30 inches? Um, two feet, um, I'm gonna say six feet. I don't know none of this, damn, I feel bad. What is a sign that you've been infected with C. elegans? Um, for C. elegans, um, I mean, maybe just like nauseous. Maybe get more hungry. To like more hungry. If like it's a parasitic. Maybe it takes her food. Yeah. Okay. That's a good guess. It's a good guess. Lose your eyesight. Um. I don't know. Um. Hair. Hair. hair? Like extra hairiness or like or loss like, of hair. Like, like fat hair or dirty hair. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. It would tell the body something. The body has a way of, you know. You go blind. I don't know. <laughs> It's not a pathogen, but you could be infected with C. elegans right now and you have no idea. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> yep. scary. Yep, yeah. yep. Okay, my last question is, did you get vaccinated? And if so, which vaccine? 
I did, and I got the Johnson & Johnson one. Congratulations. And did I get the vaccine? Oh, no. No. Are you going to do it? Am I going to do it? Well, like the C. elegant has survived for probably millions of years on its own accord, just like we've survived for millions of years on our own accord. Hey, Curtis, we've been in the field for a long time. Remember when we got data like one gene at a time? I'm still doing that a lot of times. Now, of course, you know, a single experiment for a couple hundred dollars can capture so much data that, you know, you've got to have computer programs to convert it into something you can understand. You're talking about dimension reduction. So here's a diagram from the open worm resource. It gets really complicated, right? So we can reduce it to two dimensions. Oh, you mean like putting it on a slide with a cover slip with no auger? Exactly, and wick away all the M9. Then you have dimension reduction. But why stop there? Can't you like squish it in the XY direction too? Right, and now you have that worm in one dimension. Worm singularity. But seriously, data science with things like single cell transcriptomics has given us visualizations that take a ton of data and give us a smattering of colored dots. Yeah, so you're talking about principal component analysis, TSNE, UMAP. Exactly. So I thought we could help people understand what the data are telling you by the shapes of what you get from this type of work. So for example, a typical 10x genomics type of experiment generates something that looks kind of like this. I see, so the graphs tell you something about the structure of the data. Why do the dots move around like that? It's an iterative process. We start with very loose clusters and they get better as we go. So for example, this one tells you you're looking at a global analysis of transcription. I see. So that's literally a UMAP analysis, and one that's also appropriate for the international meeting. So I got to thinking, there must be other ways the patterns in the data can tell you something. So that's what you'd get if you were studying transcripts in the pharynx. Exactly. I don't know what to do with these results. This project is bananas. And the data here are telling you you're going to get some big grants. Oh, and this one's a very happy result. And this one, not so happy. The barf emoji. Uh-oh, back to the drawing board. These data are poop. I think this one's telling you that a Nobel Prize is in your future. Yeah, or else it's an American penny. What about this one? Ah, nice, it makes its own pie chart. And this one, I think the sequencing company might have gotten your worm samples mixed up with those of another organism. Ah, nice cluster on this one. I wonder where we should publish the results. Just a couple more. Oh, look. It's the 2020 Electoral College map. Now you just know the data must have been a result of massive fraud. Okay, and what's this last one? That looks really familiar. <laughs> I was wondering when Bernie Sanders was going to get a cameo in the show. I wonder if we should ask people what vaccine they got, or what do you say to the coronavirus? Funny. Well, which one? Uh, I don't uh, say trademark. I got the Moderna vaccine. Moderna. Moderna. Moderna? Moderna, which is appropriate because my nickname is Mo. Moderna all the way, baby. I was really excited that I got the Moderna vaccine, um, mostly because my initials are RNA. Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer. I am team Pfizer. 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 The Pfizer Beyond. I got the Pfizer vaccine. J and J, Johnson and Johnson. A little scared about it. <laughs> Six feet apart. Could you just add one more weird symptom that would convince people that they have to get vaccinated? 
You're all about this spike protein. I think you're trying a little too hard to be tough. Where they were before January 2020. <laughs> Who are you? Who are your birth parents? Where did you come from? Did you come from a lab? On the ice? Uh, one. Stop making new variants. Stop mutating. Stop mutating. You suck. Go away. It's time to go. F*** off. <laughs> well, Morris, I have to say, I sure am looking forward to when it's going to be possible for us all to get together again in person. I know that all wormers feel the same way. This past year and a half has just about worn us completely out. But the good news is, I think we've got a good, solid plan for our first and hopefully last virtual worm show. Do you think it'll hit all the right notes? We're gonna make fun of a lot of the things that happened this year. Hear from people in the community. And with a few good jokes, hopefully we can bring a smile to people's faces out there in cyberspace. Okay, okay then, then, let's, let's do, do it. it. Hello, I'm here to audition for the position of Worm Show Host. So what do you think? Do I get the job? No? Why not? <laughs>